digital files of this so that we could put uh, some subliminal Tylerism into the Fox logo. I actually went to Arnon after the thing and said, please let me do, redo the Regency logo. <laughs> so <clears throat> the opening title sequence was supposed to be starting inside the fear center of, of Edward Norton's brain and you, the, the electricity that's running through it is like photo electrical stimuli that's running down running through his brain. These are supposed to be impulses you know fear based impulses and we're supposed to be pulling through we're changing scales the whole time so we're starting at like you know the size of a, of a you know a dendrite or whatever these things are we're sort of pulling back through and we're going through the frontal lobes and we're going to exit we go into this there's this whole black section in there where it's just like little particles going by which is we've left the brain and we're now moving to the um the skull casing this is inside the skull where Arnon's name appears it's actually inside the, the skull of inside bone which apparently there's some fluid in, I didn't know that. And then we pull out through this clogged pore <laughs> in Edward's face. I remember showing him, the first time we showed him the uh, rough test of this, he was like, my face is not that dirty. And I said, you know, this is all based on actual photographs of your skin. People are always asking me if I know Tyler Durden. So, but I wanted to do this you know, if there's ever a chance for, for a Fight Club ride at Universal Studios, this is going to be it. The, the brain ride, kind of flying down Edward's nose and seeing all the little crusty scabs at the end of his nostrils. That old saying, how you always hurt the one you love, well, it works both ways. We have front row seats for this theater of mass destruction. The demolitions committee. The shot where the the camera tilts down and falls, you know, away from the skyscraper, and then goes through the um, through the street and goes into the subterranean parking, and then across the street and into the other subterranean parking, was kind of something that we hit on late in the in the film. We were um, trying to kind of come up with ideas for ways to show his thought process, his kind of manic disassociative state. And so we had this idea we were going to do, we, we, we knew we were going to do the whole kind of tour through his kitchen and show how the whole kitchen had filled up with gas and how, how his uh, apartment, some kind of logical explanation for how his apartment exploded. And when we started seeing the tests for it, we thought we got to do more of this. There has to be a couple of other times in the movie where we see kind of how quickly he, he thinks, his thought process. And when we saw the photogrammetry tests of the kitchen stuff, we started thinking, well, wow, we could really open the movie on the 31st floor of this building and then go out the window and drop all the way down and see the bombs and see the ticking and see the, the jerry cans and then go through the side of the van and across the street and into another. So that became sort of a little, not thematic, but it was a, a little bookended kind of a precursor to how crazy his thought process is. When Deep Space Exploration ramps up, it'll be the corporations that mean everything. The IBM Stellar Sphere. This is another example of it. The, um, 
galactic tour of garbage. Oh, there's any fans. And Zach Grenier, he's a really terrific actor. I don't think he really appreciated us saying, oh, you're perfect for this smarmy boss's role. <laughs> I don't know if anybody ever really likes being perfect for the smarmy boss's role. But I always wanted, the, I, I always liked the idea of, of the boss being this guy who's not, he's trying to kind of be empathetic, but to this, you know, guy who works for him, but he doesn't really want to get involved enough to truly find out how deranged he is. So he's always kind of trying, he's caught between a rock and a hard place, and it's only later in the movie that he realizes that this guy's a disgruntled postal worker in the making. The Fernie catalog idea was, again, some kind of visual representation of, of this, you know, the idea that we're a byproduct of the armor that we select to let people know who we are and that those that's not just clothes and cars and, and you know, hairstyles, but it's also the furniture that you pick and whether or not it's, you know, sort of southwestern or pottery barn or, you know, IKEA. In this case it's IKEA. You know funny thing when we um I got asked to do some liner notes for the record that the Dust Brothers did, and um, I got called by Fox Legal, and they said, because I'd written this thing in the, in the liner notes that said, the Dust Brothers are, you know, talented and and witty and brilliant and all these things, and, and the little quote ended with saying, they don't have a stick of Ikea between them. And um, we got a call from Fox Legal saying, you can't use these liner notes because it's corporate disparagement. And uh, <laughs> they were asking if they'd seen the movie. If you haven't seen the movie, do you know what real corporate disparagement is? But uh, they were very nervous about Ikea being upset. And thus far, we haven't heard anything from them. Actually, I got a call from somebody. <laughs> well, can we rewrite this thing? Can we, does it have to say that they don't have a stick of... Can it just say they don't have a stick of prefabricated furniture? And I said, no, 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 it's uh, Ikea. It's a joke. It's in the movie. You have to understand that. And they said, well... Now we've called them, and uh, John King swears to us that they do indeed have a lot of IKEA furniture. And I just said, 